So in the last few years, some people ask, well, where's the great turning? Everything's going to hell. And, and it's, well, it, it looks like uh, it's not an alternative to collapse. It's with it, you go through, it will be an inner vision and orientation to bond us and move us through. Yeah. It can't be done with the industrial growth society. Mm -hmm. It has to be done when that's out of the way. And that's going to be the messiest thing we could even begin to conceive of. A lot of dying. Yeah. They're going to have to be very strong. But we have a great banner to carry. And that is uh, the memory. There were humans here and there were great cultures and we'll take some of it. Because the loss of our past is one of the most grievous things for me. Yes. I want people to be able to remember Shakespeare and uh, the Lord Buddha and know about I don't want it to all go with us, for Christ's sake. Yeah. So that there, that we have, uh, and then you can vision there, we could be illumined by taking so right out of ourselves, out of our separate, except we're always comparing with other people. Am I good enough? Do I have enough? And that's washed away. That just falls away, is blown away by the power of this and say, we are children of the passage. We're going to make a way through. We're going to be guided by a, the creation of a life-sustaining society. We can do it. Now, a lot of them will die on the way. But I think that there's, there's no reason to think that we, that, 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 to rule that out. And it's a beautiful thing to, it calls me. Mm. It calls me to want to uh, describe and invite people and in describing that and singing it. Uh, Joanna, what a total treat to be able to see you and hear you and interact with you in this kind of a uh, format uh, with Barbara and um, part of this post doom series. So welcome and thank you. If you could just share with us sort of what's fresh for you, what's new for you, um, where are you in your thinking and feeling about these, uh, about these times and um, languaging it because your encouragement uh, back when I was getting a little bit of pushback from some colleagues on the term post doom, uh, you said, um, and I was grateful that, no, this is what our times call for. This is exactly what's needed at this time is, is a post doom. And now you're kind of flooded with people. Want to yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, know I know. So, so anything that you'd like to say just yeah. at the start to bring us fresh to where you're at. Okay. I would. Uh, well, first of all, I think about this all the time and what I'm thinking about is a how to uh, help people accept it and understand it in as big a framework as possible out of as big a sense of identity with creation as possible. And that this is uh, because I myself genuinely feel that this is an incredibly privileged time to be alive that gets conveyed through my manner and my voice and my choice of words. Yes. Then I also have, so that's one point, the also, I also have the sense of very strong deja vu increasing because it takes me back 42 years to 1977 mm. in the spring when my life just broke open uh, in uh, having attended with my teenage children, the Jacques Cousteau Society Symposium at the Boston Coliseum. And this was an incredible event. 
And I don't think it was ever repeated, but there in one building on three floors of this immense structure, there were scientists and activists from uh, on all the issues, mm -hmm. all the, not just the oceans, mm -hmm. but everything from uh, forests to um, acid rain to um, double hulled oil tankers to stop the everything. And, um, and it was, there were booths with all kinds of literature. There were speakers, there were panels. There was a lot on nuclear uh, energy and nuclear uh, waste. So not so much the nuclear weapons, but it was the mm -hmm. uh, contamination by of nuclear fabrication of missiles that was. And I, on that one day, went through the whole building and and with my kids and I, the way we were familiar with almost all the issues because of our work in Syracuse with a citizens group called the New Environment Association. So we knew it all in a way. Mm -hmm. and it was all up here in my head. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, but I was tired. And at the end, I sat down to rest my feet and let them go off to a concert with John Denver who had opened it, as you can see, it was a beautiful, oh, what an event. And I trapped there by my fatigue and the alcohol, I watched a, a video looping over and over again, uh, camera fo focused on one man in a cowboy hat uh, with his boots gripping a baby seal, squirming, uh, mm. grabbed slowly and meticulously beating it to death around the head. And I just, I was too tired to do anything but move, to even move my eyes away. But by the time I got up, um, the uh, information that I was thought I was so familiar with mm. moved from location in my upper, uh, where I kept a lot of stuff up, perched mm -hmm. up there. And as I said, he pulled out the pins and it all cascaded down through my body, heart, voice, everything. And I remember thinking, oh my God, hmm. we can, and just letting it in, we can destroy our world and we probably will. Because hmm. if we can do something, we humans with our monkey hands and brain and agility and with it. We will, when, if it's there, we'll do it. <laughs> yeah. And then on the subway back, it broke down and I alone, it just, it just sat there with tears streaming, looking at the people in front of me and beyond them, the Charles River and the setting sun and the sailboat sailing. And from that moment, I couldn't talk about it for 15 months, it was a really dark night of the soul. Yes. And uh, I, but I worked. Everything was, it was just working at me as deeply as possible. And, and then just of August, that was in May and August of that. No, it was yeah, of the next year. Uh, I was uh, chairing a working group on the human prospect at the Society for Values and Higher Education at Notre Dame. And in that, I decided we are not gonna read papers. We are not gonna hold this at arm's length. And I asked everybody to open simply, not with your rank, not with your title, but with a story from your life, an instance of how the planetary crisis had touched your life. And that was sort of the bookend from the moment on the, yeah. over the Charles River to that moment. And it, people can talk about it. People must talk about it. Yes. And people must understand that this is good news. It's that they're, tears, their grief, 
if, uh, is an invitation to get in touch with your deepest feelings of grief or alarm because they are rooted yes. in our belonging to this planet. Mm. Yes. And exactly. when we get that, then we all things can flower beyond our expectation. So here I am, um, 42 years later, and uh, the uh, what the dice are loaded or what every there's so much more at stake, and I'm back wondering how can we talk about this so that uh, people don't because the the avoidance is yet greater or maybe not. What do you think? it seems like denial of painful, difficult, challenging stuff is so deeply rooted that, yeah, you've got massive amounts of not just one form of denial. You've got denial on the left, denial on the right. It's just, it's, um, yeah. Well, Joanna, I have, I just have a question that relates to that is that, um, part, I think part of the denial relates to an insistence on hope. And even the Green New Deal has a lot built into it on that basis. And I'm just, uh, um, I'm just yeah. wondering how that fits into the conversation around denial. Yeah, it's a form of denial because um, we can't turn it around. To simply say we can turn this around is ridiculous. When our CO2 emissions are growing, let's not, we're not cutting them in half. We're, they're growing wildly and, and so is the methane emissions. And uh, we have, look at us with our cars, look at every aspect, look at these transnational corporations that are uh, needing to uh, keep that c curve of their profits at any cost. Mm -hmm. The extraction industry, look at this. I bet you've experienced this in the work that we connects that uh, when you connect with each other genuinely, really, you are you help each other come home to life. <laughs> you become alive again, and you don't need to something in the future. That, and of course, you know, in Buddhist practice, there's no not even a word for hope in in the Buddhist tradition. Mm -hmm. But because it's it takes you out of the present moment, and this is the moment when you can come alive to each other, to yourself, to your love for this life, to the depth of your grief. Mm -hmm. But that's life. Life itself heals for the sake of life. Yeah, I, I, I've been thinking recently in the last couple of months of hope as kind of like liquid. Some liquids that will sustain us, some liquids will kill us. Um, there are forms of hope that if we hope in the continuation of wasteful industrialism, capitalism, that sort of thing, we're actually prolonging overshoot. We're, probably the most significant book I've ever read is William Catton's book, Overshoot, The Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Change. And wow. he's got a fabulous quote there where he says that uh, human self-restraint practiced both individually, but especially collectively, is our in indispensable hope the sacred limits. I mean, that it seems to me that is the distinguishing characteristic of cultures that don't foul their own nest is that they honor the limits of the living world as a, as a sacred responsibility and our sense of limitlessness and, and limitless expansion on a finite earth is precisely the opposite of what has any sense of ecological sanity. Um, uh, I believe from my first time round that that earlier dance with, despair is that what uh, the voice that people need to hear is not mine or yours or famous people it's their own it's the voice inside them and what has the, been the magic to me in the uh, workshops to work together with other people and begin to speak totally unguarded and it feels so good and you're it's not an argument you're not trying to be right or make the other guy wrong it's not about who has the most facts it's about how you feel 
and what you uh, see uh, and what you the smell and what your senses, your sensory life and your affective life. And that's immediate and no one can argue with that. You don't have to win an argument. Yeah. You just have to say, uh, I heard my daughter was pregnant and I burst into tears. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then nobody can argue with that and say, oh boy, you're just, a, you know, uh, you and your extinction fascinations, you know. And, and, it, uh, and there is something so um, magic happening. Yes. Well, Joanna, because so many people in this series, I've, I've already had probably about 35 conversations and who knows how many there'll be total, probably more than 90 uh, that I'll be going, you know, over the course of the next six, seven months, there's no rush, but many, many, I would say two thirds of the people or sometimes more cite the work that reconnects as being one of the core things that have uh, helped them or inspired them or supported them in this sort of post doom world. If you could just take just a few minutes and just help whoever's watching this or listening to this conversation that Barbara and I are having with you, help us get a, a sort of a nutshell, give us a sense of the work that reconnects and how that's uh, grown or evolved or developed over time. Well, and what I want to just say first is that in that first round with the beginning in the, uh, late 70s, early 80s. Um, what happened almost right away as people expressed their grief or despair or dread or fear, they, uh, what I did not expect was that there would be a shift in their, in their sense of identity. Mm. And yes. that uh, within the first year, I remember, people were often in joking you know, while well, speaking as one nerve cell to another. And they were uh, talking as if they were, we were together in the body of our planet. Yes. And there was a shift of identity to the larger body in which ho holds us. Mm -hmm. And that was not even in my head. Wow. Yeah, because I think that's one of the most profound things about your work and you know, Thomas Berry and others who bring us back to this epic of evolution, this big history, sort of big green history is the sense of identity, the expansive sense of identity. I mean, your book, World as Lover, World as Self, uh, probably more than any other book that I read at the time, really was all about that expansive sense of identity, um, that our identity doesn't stop with our skin, that it includes the bioregion, the planet, ultimately the and universe. It's there. it's there in all the mystics, and it's there in the prophets too. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, there in all the traditions, too. And it's there in the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And it's the profound sanity that allows us to carry this journey that we're making through time. Um, so uh, that, but, uh, that, that would just happen unexpectedly. I'll never forget that. Since, and, and so then when I... Uh, and I thought, oh boy, I guess that's a real demonstration of Paticca Samuppada, you know, the Buddhist core doctrine. But what really helped was uh, deep ecology and the teachings of Arnie Ness, mm -hmm. particularly as they were um, infused John Seed mm -hmm. and working with him. And John Seed is basically also uh, earth mystic and helping people make it a breakthrough. It's a spiritual breakthrough. Yes. Remember, you remember the story when he was standing in front of the old growth trees mm -hmm. of Gondwana land that he was, mm -hmm. he and his mates were trying to just hold off the illegal uh, logging until they'd gotten a court injunction, just hold it off. Do we get an environmental impact study? And there he took me where that happened. And the um, chainsaw screaming, he was describing it, and the, and the great grappling hooks with him swinging the walks and the paddy wagons there 
gunning their motors and the police on their bullhorns and and John and his mates just standing there with nothing but their bodies just standing there in front of the trees. And that's when this epiphany happened. And this is epiphany that we can have to all of us. We said, oh, it's not John C. protecting the rainforest. The rainforest is protecting herself through these pieces of humanity. It is nurtured into existence yes. across the millennia. Yes. Now, every time I think of that, every time I tell it, and it's been uh, 33, four years, it has the same impact on people. You felt it, didn't you? I yes. did, even yes. telling it. Do we feel that jolt? Barbara, did you feel it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. And it counters exactly what we're talking about, which is this profound identity, the sense of, of, of a who we are, our self, our genuine self is connected in reality. It's connected in time to the past and the future and connected in space in terms of this like nesting dolls of, of natural reality. Well, you know, Joanna, I'm curious, how, how has this profound sense of embodiedness in terms of human nature as part of nature, nature, part of life's nature, God's nature, reality's nature, um, how has that sense of relatedness at both the nested spatial scales as well as time, that big picture perspective, how has that nourished you, supported you, uh, and supported the work that reconnects? Well, I suppose that it has supported me um, far more than my capacity to put it into words. I can't even begin to tell you. And even that, I feel the presence in my chest and my voice thickens with emotion. I tell you what a privilege it is to be on earth for earth at this time. And I'm so glad for these decades of work that have got me accustomed to it. But you don't need to. I've, you know, you can have it be as new as yesterday um, to uh, feel that you're home. Mm -hmm. Now, once if you're already home, then, so whatever happens, you don't get all tied in a knot as to whether you can accomplish this little step or that little step because your individual anyway would be so inconsequential that you, uh, but whatever happens, whatever happens, you're home. Yeah. You're, you're reminding me of a quote that I used to use a lot of yours, or at least it's a paraphrase of one of yours from years ago, um, where here's my sort of paraphrasing way of saying it is that this shift, the shift from thinking of ourselves as separate creatures on earth in a universe to thinking of ourselves as a mode of being of earth, an expression of the universe, this shift is essential to our survival because it can serve in lieu of morality and because moralizing is so well, ineffective. It's much more trustworthy morality yes. than, than the altruistic view. Yeah, because then it becomes a matter of self-preservation. It's like, I wouldn't, you know, I think somewhere in that quote was like, you know, I would never suggest to you, don't cut off your leg. No, don't cut off your leg because your leg's a part of you. Well, so are the trees in the Amazon basin. That's what we're waking up to is that we are our world. And what we do to our world, we do to our larger self, our larger body. So and, that uh, can save us. Yeah. But what's saving, you know? Uh, what can help people now move through because that's that preposition is my preposition for this time we don't know it's an end we do know or at least it looks pretty certain to me that the uh transnational corporate uh, economic system is killing our world and all its beings it's got to be over soon. Uh, but we don't need to. For, for decades, I've been telling people in workshops, you don't need to attack 
our political system, our economic system, because it's already self-destroying. Right. What you do is what we want to help it land softly or destroy as little as possible on its way down. Mm -hmm. And we think, how can we even imagine in so much uncertainty that there could be a way through? But I'll tell you, there's certain people I meet and the sense is upon me there and the words come that these are children of the passage and the passage is the passage between cultures. They may, they'll have a hard time. It may take generations. But we cannot have the arrogance of thinking that this is the end of complex life forms. It looks like it often, but if we, I think, and there's so, and also I think that this moment, what I ache to do is to uh, develop ways that give people an appetite and tools for working together and caring for each other. Just as simply as that, yes. we've been so atomized by hyper-individualism of the late, last five centuries. Yeah. And we, it makes us passive, scared, and obedient. And we're largely distracted or addicted when you look at how much distraction and addiction whether it's sports or social media or drugs and alcohol or tobacco, caffeine, video games, shopping, internet porn, internet, you know, the, the whole gamut of things that people can be distracted by. Uh, you know, we've lost touch with themselves. Yes, now, exactly. Now is such a sweetly powerful time to meet and knit together trust and ways to, uh, what I used to call rough weather networks for reaching out to each other. But then in a, just on a block, I could write here on Cherry Street, you know, what are the ways that we can uh, invite each other to begin to uh, learn the skills and the habits of the heart that we will need, uh, as well as some good uh, stone soup recipes. <laughs> yes, exactly. So when you say a passage between cultures, is that the passage into um, this culture of the heart, into well, a different kind of practicality? Because the, uh, in the work that we connect, we talk about the great turning. Mm -hmm. We talk about, um, in this time, there's the... Uh, devouring industrial growth system there's the great unraveling and there's the great turning and the great turning are the ways that we are conceiving of and seeing glimpsing and opening and transforming for a life sustaining culture so in the last few years some people ask well where's the great turning everything's going to hell and and it's well it it looks like uh, it's not an alternative to collapse. It's with it, you go through, it will be an inner vision and orientation to bond us and move us through. Yeah. It can't be done with the industrial growth society. Mm -hmm. It has to be done when that's out of the way. And that's going to be the messiest thing we could even begin to conceive of. A lot of dying. Yeah. They're going to have to be very strong. But we have a great banner to carry. And that is uh, the memory. There were humans here and there were great cultures and we'll take some of it. Because the loss of our past is one of the most grievous things for me. Yes. I want people to be able to remember Shakespeare and uh, the Lord Buddha and know about, that. I don't want it to all go with us for Christ's sake. Yeah. So that, that we have, uh, and then you can envision there, 
we could be illumined by taking so right out of ourselves, out of our separate self, we're always comparing with other people. Am I good enough? Do I have enough? And that's washed away. That just falls away, is blown away by the power of this and say, we are children of the passage. We're going to make a way through. We're going to be guided by a, the creation of a life-sustaining society. We can do it. Now, a lot of them will die on the way. But I think that there's, there's no reason to think that we, that, 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 to rule that out. And it's a beautiful thing to, it calls me. Mm. It calls me to want to uh, describe and invite people and describing that and singing it. Connie and I spent two months in Eureka and then we just drove up here to Whigby Island. And in route, we stopped and saw some friends and colleagues uh, in Ashland, Oregon, and then Eugene. Um, and in our conversation, dinner conversation with Tom Atley in Eugene, one of the interesting things that Tom shared that I thought was really helpful was he said that he operates with a bubble and his bubble is his work. It's his legacy work. And when he's inside his bubble, he operates with as much passion and joy and enthusiasm and commitment trusting that there may only be a small percent chance that it's likely to be effective in any large scale, and yet he has to act with the sense that it will be effective, even though he can also step outside. He likened it to going to a movie where you, where you agree uh, to suspend judgment. So you go into a movie theater, you just take it on value, you know that it's just cinema, but you allow yourself imaginatively to step into that world and you think and feel from that perspective. And that when he's in his bubble, it's, it's all about, you know, just being as successful as he can be, even though he also can step outside the bubble and say that there may be a half of 1% chance in any realistic sense that this work is going to be as effective as he would like it to be. And yet, in order to maintain sanity, in order to uh, feel great about himself, looking himself in the mirror every day. With his own creativity. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, your work came up in a conversation, actually some of the work that you did back when, when you were writing and doing workshops on despair and empowerment in the nuclear age, um, the, the threat or the concern among some people who get collapse and get contraction and get, you know, uh, abrupt climate change and things like that is what the heck are we going to do with the nuclear, you know, is there some way to help ensure that most, if not all, of our nuclear facilities don't just wag out in a societal collapse and then cause untold destruction for the body of life for millions of years to come. And I wanted to just revisit that with you. Uh, has that been, uh, you know, that, that idea of sort of sacred guardians of nuclear sites that, uh, that you spoke about? And my first conversation uh, with the... Uh, deep adaptation folks uh, in a conversation with them and Jim uh, everyone was sort of focused on how, how they were accepting this and I was very antsy sort of telling my sister look we've got to see get that 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 the storage pools don't explode yes. on every nuclear react reactor station in the world is going to be another little Hiroshima if we don't uh, ensure that they, they can continue having the energy to cool the, <laughs> to cool the radiate their storage pools. I think that's uh, a job to be done. And I think that uh, that could be something that communities could take on. So much of our knowledge has been digitized. I know. We hardly know how to treat measles or caulk a boat if we, without looking it up mm -hmm. on the tube, on the, on, or on, on the internet. I think one of the tragedies of this time is that education, formal education, college education continues down the same ruts that it's been in. And there is nothing that's teaching people um, how to 
do the jobs that need to be done that can only be done in the short window that we have. Yes. And there, there's such an old uh, overlay of what, uh, you know, a good liberal education is all about, that these, these capabilities that are needed are, um, um, you know, it, you have to be, you have to have a huge amount of, uh, of fiber in yourself as a young person to jump out of the track and uh, um, and 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 really educate yourself. And I know uh, some young people that were ready to do that, and their parents wouldn't let them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they're caught, and the thing that that but this college education is will be of limited use. And what's so tragic is that these youngsters are used to having learning everything with their you know, poking the, at their cell phone. Right, and exactly. There it is. They can tell you right away who did this and that in what century, but they don't have any memory right. of the, what we used to have to learn and integrate about history and geography and social studies. I'm just wondering, like, um, what you might have to say, thinking about young people, about the... Um, Extinction Rebellion that's going on and, and so many courageous um, young people that are um, on the streets and feeling their own agency at this time. Um, and the, a, a lot of that is, is in the category of, of working towards taking down the matrix or system as it's been, as opposed to focusing on the jobs that need to be done. So I'm just, I'm just wondering what you, yeah, what you hold in your heart to say to um, this swell. That's a wonderful, wonderful question. Because what I heard, and I heard it again from Germany. I remember calling you right after the first call to talk with the uh, really impressive leaders of the student strike uh, that's huge in Germany. And telling me how the young people themselves were in despair, that the grown-ups, parents and other adults were taking hope from the student strikes, but the students themselves were not. Yeah. And they were in, and the, uh, and a friend just uh, called me yesterday uh, from Bavaria, so at the other extreme of the country, about the, his daughter, 17, who is in such despair. And he said, well, uh, what my friend, what I would say and my friend Joanna would say, good, at least you feel it. At least you feel it. And now you just know where it comes from. It comes from your connectedness with all life. It comes from your caring. It's not crazy. Yeah, and that's the big message. This is what you need to know. You are in despair. Yeah. And that can, is a sign of your caring. Yeah. And that is a sign of your deep, and that caring comes from your deep interconnectedness with all of life. So he didn't try to make cheer her up, which is the, terrible step we take isn't it right because so many people assume you're going to get stuck there if you go there okay. the, th the through piece of it gets lost yeah, yeah. that's right and that was you know barbara that was what people were feeling back in the late 70s yeah, yeah. and it was uh oh i can't go there oh no i've got a job i've got a family to support no, don't ask me to feel this. Don't ask me to talk about it. Now, I'm not going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Because if I do, I'll just be swallowed up and I'll be good friend. Nothing. Mm -hmm. So they think they're going to be lost in this bottomless well when exactly the opposite happens. Mm -hmm. They yeah. get linked up again with life and they feel the pulse of life. And they feel almost their heart warming. They feel their gratitude for each other. They love each other when they hear the same words coming out of them. Just, oh my God, oh buddy, you care too. It turns just into caring, that's all. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the fear of pain 
and the fear of losing hope has been a great assistance to the Industrial Growth Society. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, another way that I've thought of it recently, that hope itself becomes um, an avoidance of a risk to go through. Um, yeah, it's, it feels like a risk. You know, it's, it's interesting. Related to that, I'm talking to you from the mother-in-law wing of a house on Wigby Island uh, in Freeland, Washington. And it just so happens that 10 years ago this week, um, 10 years ago this month, I was going through a very serious bout of cancer where I had a tumor the size of my fist and my spleen. And mortality and impermanence and death were more abstract concepts. I did have one profound mystical experience at the age of 20 where I was given a vision of my death and sort of my legacy. So I've had some sense of awareness of my own mortality and using that as a guide. But it became real front and clear and center for me 10 years ago. And by the grace of life, I have not lost that for the most part, where I remind myself each season that this could be my last and to not put off the, the, the things that I can do that can make potentially a difference at some scale. Um, but also what a gift it is. I'm, I'm 60 years old now. At that time, I was 50. But still, the, the sense of like, wow. What a grace to be alive and experiencing this life and, and, and this anguish and this pain, and yet a deep trust in life, a trust in evolution, a trust in ecology, which for me, that's what faith in God means, trusting reality, trusting what's so. And, um, and I now interpret the great turning, not as humanity making it into some perfect utopian thing. We might go extinct, but still there is this heart turning a, a metanoia as it were a a a coming home to our true self coming home to life the way you've articulated it um that's that's a redemptive process even if we go extinct in the near future and that feels like holy holy work um and so i wanted to ask you joanna how has an understanding of the naturalness the inevitability the sacredness of impermanence and death how has that nourished you uh in your uh personal life and in your and in your work impermanence brings us alive how stale we would be if we were just permanently here like a piece of furniture even furniture is as a <laughs> but you something quickens in your heart as you see that uh people come and go and there's this moment there is only this moment and I am seeing you and I'm remembering you of 35 years ago and seeing you now at 60 looking so beautiful and having such an impact mm -hmm. and teaching such truth and doing it with such vigor <laughs> mm -hmm. and you're seeing me and you see, oh boy, there she is. Being 90 doesn't stop her a bit. Exactly. Yeah, so on uh, time, how do you relish life if you think everything's going to be around forever? Yeah. So there's this, and it quickens the senses. And you know what's helped me a lot with that? Of course, uh, the Buddhist teachings are so good for this time. They really help you. But, um, but also, I spend my enormous good fortune to uh, be a translator with another person of the lyrical poetry of uh, Reiner Maria Rilke. Mm -hmm. And it has been the most exquisite spiritual gift. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't get the slightest bit dull, it's as fresh yeah. and, uh, and we, the best way to translate is with another person where you can talk it back and forth, the German and the English or whatever the other language is. And we're doing on our fourth book now. And his sense of deep belonging, he was deeply affected. Uh, he, he was very, uh, at, when he went to Russia the first time and encountered uh, deep in the Russian Orthodox faith is a almost 
exquisite peasant sense of the spiritual reality of the earth, of belonging to the earth. Mm. Well, certainly coming to terms with loss right now and finding that, uh, yeah. that passion and love for life is, the, you know, is, is part of the work of our time. Yeah, some gifts of, of loss and to uh, yeah. kiss the moment as it passes. I'm just wondering, what for you, Joanna, because you've been such a teacher to so many of us and a mentor to so many of us in this conversation and in this whole, this whole world, um, uh, what have been some of the gifts that have opened up for you on the other side of the, the post-doom doorway, as it were? I, I feel so alive, and I can't figure out why. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm so grateful to be here. Yeah. Um, and I see people coming alive with great courage around me. And things could, who knows, but things could shift so fast. Mm -hmm. You know, the four R's of, of um, Jim Ball, the uh -huh. deep meditation. Well, uh, the other day uh, in a, a Dharma meeting, of, and there were about 800 people involved, half of them online. Uh, and I turn, uh, turn that you can turn the four R's uh, into questions. As first, I turned, actually, even before that, I did open sentences. So it's so great to give people a chance. Now, it's not a question, mm -hmm. it's an open sentence. Because if you ask a question, then they stop and think for us, even a microsecond, what's my, what should I say? But if it's, an open sentence where you give them half their sentence. It's like a slide or a shoot and they start repeating and whoop, they can't stop but come out with what they, what's there. And so uh, I tried it out because I was wondering with these Buddhists, you know, Western Buddhists, whether they would even want to talk about collapse. So I tried the open sentence in pairs. As I face the collapsing of our society, what I'm grateful for is, so I start with gratitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gratitude puts ground under your feet. Helps you to study. Well, there's a lot to say to that. Yes. And they didn't realize they were talking about a word that would have scared them. Right, nice. And then I... I also put it, I tried putting it into the present participle because collapse sounds like, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the collapsing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, the next was, uh, as I confront the collapsing of our, so what I'm afraid of is, so give them a chance to talk mm -hmm. about the fear. Of course we're afraid of it. Mm -hmm. Say it. Mm -hmm. And then I had time for one more. And this is what came to me. As I face the collapsing of our culture, what I will want to remember is. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Later on then in the day, I did, what, I did also some with the four R's into putting them, that was uh, questions for a group. But right. it gets people excited about what they want to, how they want to go through and, um, and build a new culture, what they want in it, or what, and what they know they should need to let go of. Mm -hmm. So those are great. Turn well, yeah, f feel free to, I mean, I'd love to hear your articulation. I mean, if you can remember them, but what, what were the open sentences or the statements yeah. related to the four R's? Now, these are questions now. Okay, great. And the first one is, uh, what are the values and behaviors that we want to uh, keep that are strong, that, are, that we want to hang on to mm -hmm. during the rough times ahead? Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful question. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Then what are the values and behaviors that we want to relinquish, let go of? Mm -hmm. Oh boy, quite a few come to mind. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, but everybody is adding to each other's. There's nothing right. to argue about. And then, um, what are the values and behaviors that we once had or other cultures have that we would like to restore? Mm -hmm. So you know, you don't have to go invent a whole lot, but that there are uh, ways and um, practices and. Uh, that that uh, you really really work, and then then you may remember that Jim and Katie just had the Jim had just had the three R's. right right, and then he added the fourth. By the fall, uh, they added a fourth, which is with whom do I want to make peace? Yeah. Reconcile, right? Gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah with whom, with what groups, with what aspects of society, mm -hmm. with what parts of the world, I don't know. Mm -hmm. it's, isn't that a wondrous question? Yeah. Yes. And even asking it generates the motivation. So even the question makes you want to say, oh yes, yes, there are. In this hour that may be our last hour, this is, oh, we have a chance to come together and make peace. Yes. Coming to this point in your life, Joanna, I'm just wondering, and you look back through the body of work that, that you've, um, it, created and evolved over these decades. And I'm just wondering if there's some piece of it that stands out to you as most relevant now, or, or there's something about it that you would just like to bring attention to as we, um, as we wind down here. Yes. Um. Although I've been extol you know, expressing my gratitude for the Buddhist path, I have Christian roots, liberal, Protestant, mm -hmm. Christian roots that uh, still are very alive for me. Although I walked out of that tradition in my early 20s. And um, uh, in uh, my friend Matt Fox's book, Coming of the Cosmic Christ, I saw, I jumped when I saw, read a sentence, which was, the Paschal mysteries of the third millennium will have to do with the death and resurrection of Earth, where Earth plays the role of Christ crucified. Mm -hmm. Oh. That grabbed me and I had to experience it with what we were learning with the deep ecology work. And so uh, we created down at, uh, in Southern California at OI at the OI Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, a, uh, over the Easter weekend, um, an interreligious interfaith Paschal Mysteries. And then that was so moving that later uh, at Findhorn Foundation, uh, the desire was uh, arose to have that there. And there 225 people came for uh, uh, 10 days. And it was from before Palm Sunday through East to Easter Monday. And Pat, uh, Matt Fox came for that. Uh, at the last four days. And we had people from all walks of life and traditions and no tradition. And, but we used the concept and we, and we, what we could feel again, as we had felt at the beginning was in this honoring of earth and this threat to earth and this human, damage we were inflicting, our betrayal of earth, that these spiritual traditions were coming together, like running into each other's arms. Mm -hmm. uh, they danced together, but, and we also used incredible art 
uh, especially from the Christian tradition and also from the Hebrew. But uh, the main motif was the, of course, uh, the uh, earth is being crucified. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we did a fall on Good Friday. We did a uh, stations of the cross. We walked with 10 groups of 20 with their crosses and the sign. They'd all picked an aspect of the earth that is being crucified. It was the burning of the Amazon, burning them. There was the AIDS epidemic. There was the Chernobyl uh, disaster. There was homelessness. And, um, and then, uh, there's, and we chanted Kyrie eleison as we did. And so there was this deep and sacred mourning. And, and then, um, sort of Celtic uh, sweat lodges for the descent into the hell. You know. But what was amazing to me, I hope I'm not talking too long, nice. but Go was on. that um, I, because I was running it, I had a group helping me, but I could call, I was calling the shots. And, and I managed to stay true to my ignorance of what would resurrect. Yes. I literally didn't know yes. what's Easter in this situation. Right. Exactly. Well, Sunday morning came and uh, the early service was down on the beach, of course, of the Firth of Moray. And, and that was when I thought, I got it. And it was a, it's held true all this time that what is resurrects is the ecological self. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That term also coming from deep ecology. Yes, exactly. The term, of course, of, of um, Arne Nass himself, mm -hmm. of the one who in widening circles opens, opens their apprehensions their concerns and their kinship with life and their ex coexistence with life until uh, it feels it feels like you're the planet and that's the ecology and that I that and I'm so grateful that that maybe that's so obvious but it wasn't obvious to me Yes. And I'm so glad I think, ah, oh, now when Easter comes, we'll all resurrect into the, I was genuinely baffled. And so, uh, so there, that was, kept, I was kept in sacred ignorance. <laughs> yeah, well, that matches my own reframing or, or sort of ecologically reframing the core mythic aspects of the Christian tradition, because I speak often in secular and, and Christian um groups yes. and um yeah that, that the greening of the self the enlargening of the self uh and really also the reframing of what do we mean when we use the word god for those of us for whom god talk is important if we're meaning a supernatural being merely outside the universe rather than a sacred name for a, an i thou relationship to the living biosphere those are two hugely different things and I think having this mechanistic understanding of God as a supreme clockmaker outside a clockwork universe uh, has done more to fuel our alienation from our oh, larger body, our larger are, self. Oh, right. You probably can't even begin to know yourself how significant this work of yours is. Mm. This is to play the absolutely irreplaceable role for people of faith and, pe and and all people. And you did it, you did it out of love. You did it out of love for, for a tradition that included so many sincere people that, uh, yeah. Thank you, Joanna. Well, Anything that you would like to say in bringing this to completion? 
Paul. Thank you so much. And how wonderful to have Barbara here. Barbara, is, are you sitting in your house? I am sitting in my house. Yeah, so let us give thanks for this time. Let us give thanks for this moment that we can with this technology. Yes. See each other and hear each other and speak mm -hmm. so that we can really know and promise that we'll hold each other vivid in our minds when we're not able to see each other yes. or hear each other. We'll internalize the presence. Yes. I, I promise I'll do that. Yes. Yes. Likewise. Yes. Amen.